Greetings, everyone. Today, I welcome Dr. Shalini Varma to the Mom Chief of Everything podcast. Dr. Varma is a board certified psychiatrist and owner of Open Life Health Psychiatry in Vernon Hills, Illinois, and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Please note that today, the information by Dr. Shalini Varma is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice diagnosis or treatment. All content is for general information purposes only. Dr. Varma makes no representation and assumes no responsibility for the accuracy of information contained on or available in the presentation. And such information is subject to change without notice. You are encouraged to confirm any information obtain, obtained from or through this presentation with other sources and review all information regarding any medical condition or treatment with your physician. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment because of something you heard in this presentation. Dr. Varma, again, I welcome you. And can you just get us started today by sharing a bit about yourself and why you're so passionate about the mental health profession and being a psychiatrist? Uh, thank you so much, Annette. Thank you for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> I actually um, trained and on the East Coast. I trained at Drew University and then at Rutgers Medical School in Newark. And I originally went into anesthesiology, so I have a great deal of medical background. However, there weren't that many people to talk to as an anesthesiologist, and I enjoyed talking to people. The rooms were also very cold. So after doing a year of internal medicine and a year, a full year of residency in anesthesiology, I switched over to psychiatry. I felt my skills could be used much better here, and I really enjoy what I do. Um, I also do use a blend of a lot of medicine techniques as well as therapeutic techniques. I look at people as a whole, I look at their lab work, I talk to their families, um, their other therapists or other medical providers to really get an idea of them as a whole, um, not only just to help them get well, but then to maintain wellness and then optimize their function. Excellent, and I love that, that whole treatment approach from the medical, from the therapy, as well as looking at the person as a whole. That's such a, such a great blend because physical health, mental health, they, they definitely coincide. We are in the midst of a very unique situation right now and challenging times for families because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Although many children may be enjoying being at home and families may be liking everybody at home, uh, and not having to go to school, they are missing out on the social interactions with other children. And I know that you treat children um, and, and help with parents. How can parents do, or what can parents do to ensure their kids are staying connected right now with other children their age? Well, one thing I'd like to tell you, a lot of the, um, the students I treat, a lot of the children I treat, they're actually missing school. Imagine that. No one ever thought that would happen. But <laughs> as much as they usually say they hate school, um, they're actually missing that structure, missing being with their friends, interacting with the teachers. So there's been um, quite a bit of loss um, all around, you know, for students. For students. Um, in terms of um, what's good, though, is that the, the family unit is at home now, which I think is good. Um, people, um, kids are spending more time with their siblings. Parents are spending more time with their kids. And so there can be both um, good and bad that comes with it. But I'll tell you, a lot of the students I see are really happy to have that attention from their parents. So that's been a that's actually been quite quite a positive thing uh, to see, you know. Mm -hmm. So now, now the siblings are competing for their parents' attention, but at least they have a lot of time, you know, to to be with their parents. Um, a lot more family dinners are happening. A lot more games are being played together. So that's actually been a really good thing. Um, in terms of um, in terms of keeping um, keeping friends and keeping friendship circles, what's great is unlike when um, when I was younger, there there are all these options out there in terms of media. So it's not just the telephone, you know, to talk with one person at a time, like in the olden days. Now you have FaceTime. Now you have um, you have I think Facebook also has a portal. There's Skype. There's Zoom. There's lots of ways to keep in touch with um, with other kids and their families as well. So I think that that's been really good in terms of being able to see people and talk to them and, and kind of get a glimpse into their house life too, because not everybody has even been to everybody else's house. So 
you know, I think that's good. Um, I also think it's, um, what else is nice is um, kids are going outside more. I think that's a really good thing, you mm -hmm. know, kind of getting, getting off the off, off their computers and social media and other ways. So I think that's been good. In terms of um, parents helping their kids be with other people, there are online games. Um, you can do, there's like house party, there's Yay Maker where you can learn how to paint and things um, virtually. There's also Airbnb right now is running um, online things where you can learn how to cook from people throughout the world. So there's, there's lots of different options and there's a lot of options for kids six and above and then 12 and above. You just have to pick the, the right um, the right events for your kids. So it's not just a matter of kids meeting with the kids they know, but it's kids meeting other kids throughout different countries too. That's great. I, I wasn't aware of the game maker, or the Airbnb. So that is great information. And I was thinking, you know, as a parent of two, two daughters, uh, I was thinking of how do I connect with, you know, my kids with their friends, but I didn't even think about the opportunity to connect with other kids from you know other areas and, and let kids introduce you know different cultures and and i like the food everybody's got to eat so <laughs> that's a great idea thank you for that um now you mentioned with everybody being at home you know i can imagine that some children and some adolescents may be suffering from the grief of the loss and, and you um, mentioned that as well you know they're not being able to participate in birthday parties graduation ceremonies uh, school dances sport seasons a student athlete of the spring season really missed out on you know their whole season especially if they're a senior whether they're in high school, whether they're in college. Um, what are some signs and symptoms that a parent should look for in their child or their adolescent or even young adult college age that would tell them that their child is not coping well to these changes or that their child is not just suffering from some disappointment? Right, so there are many things to look for. And now that parents are, um, are with their kids more often, they can actually notice more of these things. Like if your child is isolating more, if your child is more withdrawn, not leaving their room, um, not participating even in family dinners, um, not as communicative as before, any major changes that you see with them. Um, if you see that your kids are more irritable, more angry, their appetite has changed, they're sleeping um, differently, they're sleeping too much or they're sleeping too little. Um, those, are, those are things to look for. Or if they're looking, um, if they're looking ill too, if they're feeling ill, if they have um, sometimes with they're having more more physical symptoms like their stomach is hurting more, you know, their um, their throat is hurting, they're complaining of more of those somatic symptoms. So those are all kind of different things you can look for and see if there's any changes um, with with your kids' behavior in terms of those things. Excellent, excellent. I, I really appreciate you offering some insight with that. I know that, um, you know, when I, I mentioned before about the seniors, whether they're in high school, whether they're in college, you know, for many adolescents and college students who, especially college students who had to come home early and it's their senior year and, they, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, especially I think for seniors in college because they were expecting to graduate and maybe they had jobs you know, or the seniors in high school, maybe they hadn't made a decision with college and now they don't know, is college gonna start on time? Um, how can parents help them navigate through that uncertainty? Because that's gotta be unsettling for these transitional years. Correct, and actually um, this, this whole um, COVID has changed the way we really live and die because it's not just even just for the transitional years. So I have a lot of students that went off to college and maybe First semester was difficult for them and they were finally getting the the boat righted and doing better second semester and then they they also had to come home you know and then they lost that that momentum kind of that they had now doing online classes you know and things like that so there's no real rule book you know in this kind of time period right for, for seniors and um, even for other students I think there's even a question of whether they're gonna go back in the fall you know <laughs> so there's there's so many different things so I think a big thing that can keep into consideration too, though, is that there are these milestones, but there are a lot of other milestones that people have. I think there's a lot of stress put on 
specifically these milestones, but there's so many, um, so many other ones, you know, that kids have to look forward to. So many different kinds of milestones and uh, different events, you know, that may even come out of this. Right, right, yeah, and I see, you know, the people who had planned to get married and they're having to postpone their their weddings because, you know, every, nobody can come and, and maintain the social distancing, so that's a huge milestone. You know, babies being born, huge milestone, and then a lot of fear around that because, you know, if you're in delivering a baby in a hospital, you know, the fear uh, and the risk of exposure to the COVID-19 so I definitely, I definitely think there are a lot of other milestones that are, are affected, not just the students. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, one, one other thing that I noticed, you know, you had a great article in the Kenosha News recently, and especially about the rising concern of loneliness and isolation. And there was another article about the risk of addiction increasing as well. Adolescents and young adults statistically share the highest risk for addiction. Can you share your concerns about these two topics as well as share some resources for parents um, and just young adults who may be living on their own and experiencing this uh, type of grief or um, loneliness or isolation because they're, they're single, they're by themselves? Right, right. Well, I think this is a great time that people can show resiliency you know, and people are much more resilient than they think. Um, some of the adolescents and young adults, it's actually been kind of positive with them being at home because some of them um, don't now have access to the nicotine that they had access to before, marijuana, um, drugs and alcohol, things that they were able maybe to get from their friends or get from other places or steal from places. So actually this time has been a really good kind of reset time for me to work with, to work with people while they're getting off these substances, decreasing a lot of those variables, which, um, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a thing that no one really saw coming. I've been sending people for higher level treatment programs and things like that, you know, if they're needed, because now's a time when they don't feel like other kids are going to miss them, you know, <laughs> and they don't feel like right. that's the level of stigma, you know, so that actually for some kids, this has actually worked out better. Um, however, getting back to when you were talking about things to look for in your kids, um, like we were talking about with irritability, anxiety, things like that. Some kids may also be withdrawing from drugs and alcohol that they were doing that the parents may not have even known about during this time. Right, right. So I think it's very difficult for parents to confront their kids in terms of this because um, it kind of sets up a, an antagonistic relationship. Um, uh, parents also can personalize these issues very much. So I think the best thing is for parents who are concerned about these kinds of things, they can come in and see a therapist, um, come and see a psychiatrist, talk to them uh, since each family is different in terms of these about what their concerns are and maybe even bring the child in all together at a future appointment so that these things can be discussed with a neutral third party and most importantly, a trained third party. Because these are very difficult things to navigate at home by yourself and right. to confront you know, and try to set limits on and do all of those things um, by yourself. It's, it's just, it's, it's, uh, parents need a lot of help with that. They're just not equipped to do that on their own. Exactly, exactly. And, I, and I've encountered that. So in my physical therapy practice, I've had patients that obviously I'm not treating them for mental health, but they do have some mental health medications. And we have conversations about that, you know, with their physical health, that, that, which is what I'm treating them for, and making sure that overall their well-being is, is taken care of. But then I also have some patients who are not seeing a mental health care provider. And as I'm working with them, I discover that, you know, these, this anxiety, this feeling of overwhelmment is probably manifesting physically, which I can help with deep breathing, I can help with postural control, but I can't get to the root cause of the problem when the root cause of the problem is not a physical issue. So that's where I have often had conversations with patients about, have you considered seeing you know, a counselor or a mental health care provider? And um, they'll, their response is, well, I talk to my family and my friends. And what you said is the exact thing I say to them is that your family and friends are biased towards you and they're not going to be equipped 
to give you all the tools that may be accessible. So then I, I you know, like to refer them and give them a few names of people that they can they can choose to go to with regardless, you know, or regarding their insurance or, or whatever. So um, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, one of the next questions I have is the stigma of mental health services being um, a concern. And I think now is such an opportune time because a lot of people are, are worried, oh, so-and-so is going to see me walking into the mental health care provider, but I know that you offer telehealth and now they can actually go from the comfort of their home and don't have to worry about that stigma of somebody maybe seeing them. And can you talk to me and, and the listeners about how telehealth has really been an asset to you during this time? Sure. The other thing I wanted to point out to you when you said that your family is biased towards you, the problem in these really emotionally charged situations, especially where Someone in the family may have anxiety, depression, and alcohol problem, things like that, where the family may actually not be even educated enough to be for you. They might be a kind of against you. Like some of the things they do may be negative behavior. So that's Good what point. I want to do, you know, in terms of helping the family understand the illness, um, understand, you know, the prognosis and treatment and, you know, things like that. So this has kind of looking at it, you know, from all different angles when you're talking to someone who has any sort of bias. Yeah, very, very good point. Very good point. And in this situation, I usually have encountered, and I'm sure you see a much larger variety of that. I'm seeing where somebody is saying that well, I don't need to go talk to a professional because I can lean on my my parent or my sibling or my best friend. And that's where it's great to have those those um, support systems. But really, the healthcare professional, the mental healthcare professional, is the best asset in those situations. Um, so, so with that um, stigma where people often have, you know, like, oh, I, I, I don't need that, or um, they don't, they're afraid somebody might see them going into the, a mental health care provider and make assumptions about them. How, how do you overcome that in a normal, when I say normal, like pre-COVID-19, and then how has telehealth helped your practice in helping people who might be concerned about the stigma of seeing a healthcare or a mental health care provider? Actually, one thing I get in my practice a lot are parents who are, or who are overwhelmed with whether it's their kids or their spouse telling them so much about their mental health where they're trying to cope with their own problems and they 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 can't cope with others. And a lot of time with adolescents, adolescents will lean on each other, but they are not equipped any more than the adults are really to help each other. So um, then things can get very negative very fast because they're not reaching out to the right people to get help. Right. You know, so um, a pre COVID. Well, one thing I do in my practice, actually, I have, um, I have pretty large areas with multiple offices, but I'm the only provider in the office. So when people come in, it's only them. There's only one patient at a time and it's only them. So if a family comes in three people, it's just those three people at the same time in the waiting room. There's not any extra people waiting there, you know, so that's actually makes people feel very comfortable because they don't have to worry about running into someone they know from the area or anything like that. So that's been one really big thing in my practice that I've done is have people come in one at a time like that and not had any other providers there. So mm -hmm. that's been a really positive thing. Um, and then um, in terms of people coming, actually people like you are extremely helpful in getting the ball rolling and putting the thoughts in people's head that, hey, maybe you do need to see the mental health professional. That makes a big difference when they're hearing it from other people and other trained people as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, and sometimes people do need to hear it, I think, a few times because it, it doesn't like sink in. <laughs> Like, oh, maybe I do, maybe I have an issue. You know, what are other people seeing that I'm not seeing about myself? And they may not say that, you know, when somebody approaches them, but they will be thinking about it, hopefully, later on. Or maybe, you know, I give that name and the person, you know, I, I give a list of people typically, and they do nothing with it at the time. But then, mm -hmm. you know, months later, or weeks later, whatever it might be, they've finished physical therapy, but then something happens and they at least have a resource now. And I, I think that's crucial is just giving people information. 
And that's why I, I'm always there for patients within one week. Because once, once they've decided they're going to come in, to me, it doesn't make sense for them to wait three months to get in to see somebody. So I get people in within one week. And many families and patients tell me they wish that they had come in sooner. But I always tell them, well, you're here right now, so we can work, we can work from this point on. Um, primary care doctors are not equipped to deal with these. They certainly don't have enough time, and they don't have the same training as a psychiatrist does. So, you know, it makes a big difference. I also offer um, psychotherapy in addition to medications and only whenever they need each one. There's several patients I have who aren't on any medications, which is totally fine. We just do psychotherapy. I give patients as much time as they need. These aren't quick appointments. If people want to come in for an hour, they can come in for an hour. Some of the students that came back from college actually are, are realizing that, hey, this is the only time I'm even going to have time to help um, deal with my mental health issues because I was going to go on a study abroad in the summer and then, you know, like, you know, this is actually a really good pause. So I'm seeing some of them twice a week for an hour each. So this really has been a, a good kind of stopping point for some people to realize like, hey, I need to, I really need to deal with these problems and not just keep, um, you know, shoving them under the rug. Yes. And I think what you mentioned before about using this time as a reset, I think, I think that's such a good thing. Life has kind of slowed down for people, right. you know, right. and the time, like I tell, I tell my patients, like the time that you aren't doing commuting, if you commute right. for an hour one way, that's two hours per day, you've gained two hours. Let's start to look at your nutrition. Let's start to look at your physical exercise routines. Let's start to look at your sleep habits. Let's look at that because you know, that is all part of that whole body approach. And it sounds like you really do that as well. I think some of the difference makers too that you mentioned was getting people in within one week. That's key. Exactly. When somebody is, has made the decision to move forward on their health, we don't want to lose that window. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and then when you were talking about telehealth, that's actually been really good for, um, for patients in terms of um, patients who are very anxious, patients who might or who might not want to come in and just be like one-on-one -on -one with a doctor, like right from the very beginning, they've actually been very happy with using telehealth right now, you know, until I can, until we, we can get them more comfortable and then get them in. So it's been, it's been really good. Just like I said, with the kids that they have FaceTime and they have all these different kinds of options out there. Well, so do the doctors. So that works out really well, you know, to help, mm -hmm. to help more patients to cast a wider net. To help people exactly and that's that's what i found with using telehealth in my practice as well is the people who are really concerned about um coming in and, and getting exposure or if they're in that 60 plus population where they really should you know because they have other medical conditions they really shouldn't be going out of the home but there's no need to dis disrupt or stop therapy, whether it's in your practice, whether it's in mine, because we have that telehealth option. We just have to, in my line of work, I have to be a little more creative from a physical standpoint, um, but it's worked really well for my patients who, you know, are benefiting from it. Um, is, there, is there a way that uh, patients or, or prospective patients can go ahead and reach out to you if they want to reach out to you what is the best way for them to connect with you got it so the two best ways one is just to call my office 224-632-8900 once again 224-632-8900 or they can go to my website dr varma dr varma v-a-r-m-a md.com so dr varma md.com there's a form submission they can put through on there and you know i'm checking the phone all the time and always checking um and always checking the different emails and things that come in so i run a very i run a, a small practice it's just me and my one staff member so we know our patients very well this is a very quality practice um, we don't see that many patients in a day maybe seven to ten patients so I, I really have time to concentrate on the patients that i have Excellent. That is so great. Well, Dr. Varma, this has been really great to learn more about your practice and the difference makers between your small, high quality practice, that one-on-one -on -one attention versus some of the bigger practices. And, and people have to feel comfortable where they can get the best care and where they feel, you know, like they can really connect with the provider. Um, 
I also really appreciate you you talking about some of the signs that parents can look for. I think that's so important because we we aren't equ equipped with the knowledge that you have. And so just those little things, oh, that's different. You know, maybe when you speak about that, a parent who's listening, like, you know, my daughter, my daughter's been isolating. She hasn't been coming down to eat. Um, I'm going to kind of keep an eye on that a little bit. Or, or my son has been really angry and irritable. You know, maybe they can pick up on some of those signs and, and those symptoms. I also think one of the really great points that you made was about the reset and using this time where it's a little bit of downtime, it's a slower time, using this to reset, not just for the patient, but also for the whole family to kind of take that time to reconnect. Is there anything else that you would like to, to add to that um, in summary? Um, I really thank you for having me here. Um, I'd be glad to be on your show anytime because a lot of the things you talk about, like the organization tips, time-saving tips, parenting tips, I do a lot of that in my practice. I think you and I practice very similarly, and I'm really happy you can help people from a medical standpoint, too, in terms of their symptoms, you know, like, because I think it's not just when you see me, it's not just the appointment, it's also the work you do in between, just like with physical therapy. Right, right. Yeah, when you see somebody one, two, three hours a week, that's three yeah. hours out of the week. It's what they do at home that really makes the most impact. We're here to facilitate and kind of move them forward, but it's what they do at home that's so impactful. Exactly. And that's why I give homework assignments. And that's why I enlist the help of um, their network around them too, to help them also and to educate them as well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on today. And to my listeners, until next time, be bold, be beautiful, and be you.